All right, welcome to Build Back Better, Anne Arundel County. I am Anne Arundel County Executive Stuart Pittman, and we are here to talk about housing and uh, the housing potential crisis during the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, I've got a group of people here who are a bunch of experts. It's a really bang up panel that we've got. And there are a lot of us, there are six, seven, including me. So what we're gonna do tonight is, is uh, I'll introduce them, we'll take them one at a time, but I wanna, I wanna just um, lay the groundwork for the issue uh, that we're confronting tonight. Um, I think most of you know that we started out when the, uh, the pandemic became real uh, with town halls, virtual town halls. I think we did eight of them. Uh, we've changed the format, so now they're done via Zoom. Um, with a group of people focusing on a single a single issue. Uh, last week, it was nutrition and hunger. And uh, this week, it's housing and, and preventing homelessness. Um, it's, it's something that is one of those looming, looming crises because uh, in Maryland and in most states, there's right now a ban on evictions and for renters and, and also on... Um, um, on foreclosures for homeowners. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on renters. And part of the reason for that is that we have a real problem in this county in um, housing affordability and lack of affordable rental housing in particular. And we know that the people uh, who are losing their jobs at a higher rate than any other are low wage workers. Uh, and and um, uh, they tend to, in our county, live in. Um, in rental housing and the numbers that we have, about half of the people in rental housing that are under 80% of median income, which is still you know close to $80,000 for a household, um, are cost burden, which means that they pay more than 30% of their income on rent. And then there's another pretty big chunk of that um, that are paying more than 50% of their income on rent. So um, there's no question that when uh, people lose their income and they're already paying more um, of their income on rent than, than a banker would recommend, uh, that the loss of income um, threatens those folks with loss of housing. So um, we have with us, uh, I'm gonna run through the list and then we're gonna start at the top, but um, our own District 30, 30A Delegate Shanika Hudson, um, Tony Pratt, representing Anne Arundel Connecting Together, as well as her own her own organization, People Builders. Um, we have Zafar Shah from the Public Justice Center, who will talk about legal aspects of some of this. And uh, Kathy Ebner, the president and CEO of Homes for America, which is an affordable housing developer that also manages um, rental housing in our county. Um, so we'll hear from the perspective of a landlord. Um, a landlord who's trying to trying to do the right thing um, for the tenants. And we have our own Kathy Koch, who is the director of Anne Arundel Community Development Services, who um, came up with the county's eviction prevention program and manages that with uh, her team at, at uh, ACDS. Um, the first in the state, I believe, that is actually providing um, counseling and rental assistance uh, during the pandemic. Um, as a response. And then last, we have Carnitra White, who runs our Department of Social Services and all of the homeless, homeless programs and homeless services that we have in the county, um, who will talk about um, uh, means to be homeless in Anne Arundel County and what services uh, are provided. So I will, uh, I will um, admit that I actually met with everybody on this group, and we talked a little about what we're going to talk about uh, so that we would um, keep our, our comments uh, from going too long. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to ask some questions. They're going to tell you about their aspect of what they're doing um, and what they expect to happen um, uh, when this, when this um, uh, ban on evictions is lifted and the status of renters in Anne Arundel County right now uh, and what's going on. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to, we have some questions that have been emailed in in advance. And if you're on Facebook Live, you can put questions in the comment section. And um, they will show up on my screen, and we'll get to as many of them as we can um, when we all come back together at the end of each person going through their aspect of this. So um, I'm going to start with Delegate Henson, and and uh, 
she, uh, it was interesting when we went through in the beginning, um, Shanika, I'm going to call you Shanika because you're Shanika to me, um, uh, is probably what I'm excited about you being elected and, and the, your first year as a delegate in the General Assembly is that you are the advocate for housing and you have Thank come you. on like a tornado in the General Assembly and you don't take no for an answer and you know exactly what you need and you're a smart lawyer who has a lot of experience in this. And so um, when we talked about what we were going to cover, it was Shanika had was very, very clear. I, I, I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm going to let Shanika tell us what we ought to be doing. And, uh, and then I'm going to have to answer to you about whether it's possible or not. So um, take it away. No, you've been incredible on affordable housing, fair housing in the county. You've moved Anne Arundel County further in the issue of fair housing than we've been in I don't know how long. So I have to commend your leadership on that and just thank you for everything that you've done. I testified on one of the bills that your administration um, was moving forward. And I said, the fact that we are further behind than legislation that was already passed in the 60s lets you know that um, Anne Arundel County had a lot of moving to do. So I appreciate that and just commend you on your leadership. And thanks for having me tonight and everyone that's on the panel, you really did assemble an all-star panel. Um, so I have some slides prepared. If every if they have the slides, then I'll start with um, the first one, if that's ready. Excellent. And we can pop right into the second one there. So Stuart, I thought when I was thinking about this, I thought, why is this discussion so important? And for me, there were really two reasons why it's so important. And the first one is the renters. Um, they are so important to us. One reason, um, our renters, we know, are really struggling right now. We know that this last month in April, that over 20 million Americans were added to the roles of those that are unemployed. We know that, like you said, it was the low-wage worker that was the highest part of that demographic that added to what was unemployed. We know that while it was across all different job sectors, that it was not spread evenly across all the different demographics that women were unemployed, their rate went up at 2%, 2.5% higher than it did for men. We know that for Blacks and Latinos, it respectively went up 3% and 5% higher than it did for whites. So we know that um, with the pending unemployment that's going to hit here in Maryland and Anne Arundel County, once we get our numbers at the end of the month, that we'll start to see those changes too. And so for those of them that are renters, we know that the district court is saying that we still have those rent filings that are coming in um, every month. So we want to make sure that we're responsive to our renters. So the second reason why I feel like this discussion is so important, if we can go to slide two, is because our rental properties are important. We know that for two very key reasons, our rental properties are a very important part of our tax base. Uh, for instance, in the city of Annapolis, the largest single property taxpayer is a multi-dwelling apartment community that's off Spa Road. That's the city's largest single property taxpayer. So for that reason, we know that we really have to protect our rental properties and our rental housing. Another reason that rental properties are important is because in many cases, rental properties, the mortgages that are held on them, they are an important part of pension funds asset portfolios. So for our banking industry, we have to protect our rental properties and those rents being paid. So not only the residents that live in them, but the rents and the properties themselves are critical to the economic landscape and Maryland's recoveries, recovery. So that's why I feel like this discussion is really important. And then when we think about the importance of the discussion, it's what are we going to do? I know that you're an action guy, so it's not just what's the problem, but what's the solution? So I wanted to put three things on the table for discussion tonight. And those three things, the first of them, an emergency rent stabilization. We know that three other counties have done this, Montgomery County, Howard County, and Baltimore City. Some people call rent stabilization rent freeze. Um, that's when you don't allow the rent to be increased through a new lease or any other type of situation where a landlord would raise rent. And so I was reading in the paper this morning and I thought, this is outstanding. I think that Anne Arundel County has already checked the box on the first one on this list. So I'm going to be- Last night, last night we did. Well, we didn't pass it yet. It was introduced- yes. 
I want, yes, check the box on introducing, correct, on introducing this legislation, Councilman Pruski. So that's outstanding. And I heard from Councilwoman Robian, too, who was um, already supporting and applauding that it was introduced. So And, and Pickard was a co-sponsor, and I believe Lacey's on board. So uh, we just got to get the, the other, other side and get all seven, right? That would be outstanding. That would be great. It's much needed um, for, it even is stability for the market as well, when people kind of understand um, if your renters were able to afford at this rate. And for policymakers like me, when we're looking at if we want to infuse into the market assistance for renters, if we know where the rents are, we can kind of plan for what it's going to take to make sure that people have the resources they need from an assistance perspective. So when we have a piece of stabilization policy in place, it gives us the ability to really be able to help effectively. Um, the second one is utility assistance. We know that when people are at home under a stay at home order, that their consumption of utility is going to go up at home, but it's going to go down in some of those high occupancy buildings, like your big malls, your government buildings, your school buildings. No one's there turning on the water, turning on the lights, all of those different things. So if our cities that operate the water and sewer, if our um, energy providers, if people can, one, waive any reconnection fees, any late fees, that'll give some relief to people. And then two, if they can divert those cost savings into funds to be able to help people with the increased bills that they'll have just by way of being home um, during increased hours and increased consumption, then that utility assistance will help to also be able to offset some of the um, additional costs that people will have, and that'll help out with economic losses. And then the third one that I wanted to put out for discussion is maintaining and publishing data. Publishing zip code level data on eviction filings, eviction executions, foreclosure filings, foreclosure executions, and then that'll help us track our housing instability and our housing displacement. It's good for investment purposes. When people want to buy into a market, they want to know what's the turnover rate like? What are um, evictions happening like in a market if they want to invest in rental housing? Um, so it's good sound policy. It lets everybody know what they're walking into. And so those are three things I'd like to put up for discussion. So I'm looking forward to the comments and discussion and from hearing from all the other panelists. Wow, thank you. Those are those are great. And um, you know, from back back where I come from as an old community organizer, we call those demands. <laughs> <laughs> you list your demands and then you go after them and you fight for them. So um, um, and I'll take them that way. And uh, I think they're all good. And I think I think the county can deliver on on those, but we got work to do to be able to get that data. Um, and uh, I love the idea of taking some of those energy savings and putting them in their energy assistance. You're right. County buildings are not we're, not, we're not having to pay as much utility bills right now. So um, I hope folks at Central Services aren't listening because <laughs> it make their life more complicated, but we'll see. Um, Thanks. We'll, we'll try to do that. And um, so you said at the beginning, Shanika, uh, something about my leadership on housing. And um, I don't really see it that way. And that's one of the reasons um, um, why we have Tony Pratt here, because Tony Pratt will tell you. Stuart didn't lead. He followed. We had five, <laughs> 500 people show up in that church from ACT, and we said, this is what we want. And um, actually, it was, uh, we coordinated it pretty well. Um, so so uh, I think one of the reasons that Anne Arundel County didn't have a fair housing ordinance and a workforce housing bill that had been rolled back and all that was because we didn't have people organized and really fighting mm. for it and advocating for it. And then this grassroots, you know, community-based organization and the churches and everything got together and came on like a tsunami, and uh, that made it that made it possible to get get the bills passed. And and um, y'all are going to have to continue your work. So, um, what have you been working on, Tony? Tell, tell tell us how to make all this happen. So, Stuart, thank you for having me. Thank you. I think we froze or you froze maybe. Uh, where'd she run off to? Uh, okay. We might have to come back to Tony because I don't see her name on the screen anymore. She might, might have, something happened. Okay. Okay, we're gonna come back to Tony Pratt. Um, so we're gonna jump to you, Zafir Shah from Public Justice Center. Oh, there she is. 
There you are. Now she's sideways. So I'm back. You're back. You're sideways, but we'll take you any way we can get you. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> but a little bit about what I'm doing. Hi, Stuart, and thanks for having this important, important town hall. Um, you're right. You followed us, but you came in line and you're working with us. And I always like to say teamwork makes the dream work. Um, ACT as an organization is a um, broad-based organizing, which, which we believe that you build um, power through relationships. And that's exactly what we've been doing since our launch. We've been building relationships with county members county, all people in the county, we, we've heard from over 5,000 um, residents about what was important to them. And right now, what's important is persons being able to have a place to stay when this, when this uh, pandemic is over. And, and a lot of the people that I work with, that we work with, is the marginalized, subsidized communities. And I also do that with people builders myself. But um, a couple of things that I want to highlight, um, as Stuart said, he followed us, but the county executive, Stuart Pittman, and the county council took big initiatives that ha hasn't happened in our county, and one was the fair housing law. We now have a fair housing law in Anne Arundel County. How huge is that? That is extremely huge. We also have a, a affordable housing bill. We're also working on a, a moderately priced workforce development housing, which is huge. But what I want to focus on is the condition that our county is going to be left in post-COVID-19 um, with the evictions. So a lot, of, a lot of the residents that I talk to and subsidize in public housing are, are very leery right now about where they're going to be or are they going to be homeless when this is over? Are they going to have a place to stay? You know, what do I do? You know, I'm back in my rent. There is an eviction moratorium, but that's going to leave. And what we have to realize is a lot of these residents have no right to redemptions, which means is if I pay my late my rent late three times consecutively, consecutively within the year, the fourth time that landlord has the right right to file a no right to redemption, which means even if I pay my rent, I can still be homeless because they can take possession of the property. That is huge in their minds right now. Also, in when when a uh, original runner uh, does that, it's called an absolute, which is the same process, but it's just called something different. So, what my um, organization, which is People Builders Consulting, has been doing, um, we partnered with a couple of organizations, and people who've been receiving their stimulus checks wanted to see how they could give out of their abundance, and they've actually been helping people pay their rents, pay their BGE bills to stay ahead of this game. Because if they don't stay ahead of it, we're going to have a bigger problem. And, and that's going to be homelessness in our county that we don't really have a handle of as of now. And can we imagine? So that that's one of the things that we've done. Another thing that um, ACT has been doing is really building relationships so that we, we know who's being affected with evictions and we can point them to the right resources. Because a lot of times we have the resources, but people don't know where to go to get the resources, or they don't know how to file it out or how to qualify. So that's where we come in with the hands-on relationships that we can bring. And Delegate Shanika Henson is just like a tornado, as Stuart said, in this housing thing, right? So in building those relationships, we can have the people who are directly affected come and speak at the county council meeting, speak at the general assemblies on things that is really affecting them. We are definitely in all this together. We are in all, we are in this together because the safety that I had before COVID, a lot of us don't have now. And we're looking at things from a different perspective. So although COVID has brought a lot of hurt, harm, um, it has shined the light on a lot of disparities that are taking place in our county. And this is a good time for us to put a plan in place moving forward so that when we do open up, we won't, we aren't caught off guard like we were prior to COVID-19. So I just thank you, Stuart, for what you're doing. Shanika, everybody who's on the panel, we're banding together to make sure that everybody is taken care of. You know, I got to say, I was, I was on a call earlier today with the Chamber of Commerce and they had an economist talking about how the economy had been doing and how we stand now. 
and and um, how the economy had been done overall looks really good. But unlike some other countries in, in Europe where they have health care for everybody and they have they ha they have a social safety net in most most industrialized countries don't have in this country. And man, are we figuring out that we didn't have a net because everybody's falling through it when people lose their jobs for, for even if it's a few months um, and maybe longer. And, and I think that's where um, we got to wake up and see that um, we missed out on something and it was a real fragile economy because not everybody had been a beneficiary of that economy. And those are the folks who we're talking about right now dealing with having to keep a roof over their head and food and, and be able to be able to feed their kids and their parents. And, and um, we, we can't walk away from that. So. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Contrary to what a lot of people believe housing is a human right. Right. Yep. So um, we have Zafir Shah from the public justice center who deals with a lot of legal issues having to do with, with housing. Um, and um and I actually don't know, and I didn't ask you the other day much about what the Public Justice Center does. Can you start with that? I think you're muted still. Can you unmute or can can you get unmuted? There we go. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and I can talk about that. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the presentation. Public Justice Center is a not-for-profit law firm, essentially. We're a legal services provider. Um, I'm an attorney in the Human Right to Housing Project in our organization. We have several other projects, a workplace justice project, prisoner rights, health uh, justice project, uh, an education stability um, project that focuses on homeless students' rights and uh, suspension of discipline issues. Um, it, it, as an attorney at PJC, I do mostly eviction defense, so I'm down in district court. Um, mainly in Baltimore City, but I practice around the state at times uh, and see firsthand uh, the problems that already existed uh, pre-pandemic um, with uh, the ability of tenants to adequately represent themselves and defend themselves when facing eviction. Um, so today I'm invited to talk about really the legal landscape uh, of rental housing, and I'll mention some other um, homeowner-specific um, protections that exist right now um, that in this sort of helps set the stage for the rest of the discussion so folks know uh, what's the framework legally that already exists. So um, let's go to slide two here. So the there's a, a lot of mention of an eviction moratorium and I'm going to just describe what that really means in its mechanics. Um, the, the pause on evictions as well as foreclosures is really uh, set forth by the administrative order of the Chief Justice of the Court of Appeals. Uh, so Chief Ju uh, Judge uh, um, Barbara has made an order to suspend uh, all facets of eviction proceedings and foreclosures. So although the court is accepting filings, they, those are then immediately paused. Any existing eviction order, like a, a warrant for restitution or scheduled eviction uh, back from, you know, March, that's been put on pause if it hasn't already been enforced. Um, the court has a date for when it will come back into session, and that's June 6, 2020, uh, coming up real quick. That's a, a product of the chief uh, judge's um, May 4th order, essentially just stating what's an emergency uh, case that that would be heard during this time and what are not emergency cases uh, eviction cases uh, whether it's for rent uh, termination of the lease or breach of lease those are all non-emergency cases right now uh, and so we we don't we're not seeing those cases scheduled um, until after June 6th uh, what did the governor do the governor came out and said that no tenant would be evicted during the state of emergency. His executive order, however, uh, says something important, but just a little different that I wanted to emphasize. And that's, that's the fact that the governor's order doesn't set forth a moratorium. 
what it does is it provides tenants a defense in these cases, these eviction cases that are being filed. Uh, so for the pendency of the executive order, uh, sorry, of the state of emergency, uh, tenants would, when court opens, come down to the district court and present that they have a substantial loss of income due to COVID-19 uh, or loss of work or loss of wages due to the, the virus. And if they can meet an evidentiary burden uh, with, with documents that satisfy the judge, then the judge shall find that there will be no eviction, um, no, no uh, relief in favor of the landlord for that case. What um, if they don't show up? They don't show up, that'll be a default a default judgment uh, in it favor of the landlord. And so you're, you're looking at um, the fact that once the court opens, if, and, and to, to the county executive's point, only about 4% of tenants, pre-pandemic that is, were showing up to these district court cases. If that holds true, um, and I, I would expect it not to, I expect that, that percentage to go down because people are not in a posi position to be taking public transit, getting uh, into crowded buildings and sitting there for, for four hours. Um, we're, we're gonna have a lot of evictions and it goes really to Tony's point. And I, I would echo that across the legal services community in Maryland, attorneys are extremely concerned about the deluge of eviction cases coming. We know that cases are filed serially which means that every month that a, a payment wasn't made, there's a separate eviction action filed for that, um, that month. And so we expect there to be uh, folks coming or trying to come to district court in you know, less than a month, uh, facing separate eviction cases for March, April, May, and June. And as Tony was saying, that means that if someone were to lose all those cases uh, in the same month, their right of redemption would be foreclosed. And the, no matter what they can pay, no matter what rental assistance is available, they would be facing eviction possibly. Wow. Um, next slide, please. Um, now that, now I was talking about the state level and there's important federal protections under the CARES Act. Uh, so for federally subsidized rental properties and those with federally backed mortgages, there's a 120 day moratorium on filing evictions uh, and imposing late fees or penalty charges uh, for the rent um, unpaid during this 120 day period that started March 27th. And so there's, there's kind of a cliff coming. And unfortunately it also coincides with the unemployment uh, compensation expansion cliff that's coming also later in July. Uh, and that means that uh, these federal protections um, Will, will start to begin to lapse. And uh, the specific protections here are a prohibition on eviction actions for non-payment of rent. And after the moratorium expires, so July 26th, there'd, be, there'd still be a prohibition on uh, terminations and evictions except on 30 days notice. So I've spelled out here that the 30 day notice to quit or to vacate wouldn't be, uh, it, it wouldn't be allowed until uh, 30 days after the moratorium period. Um, now, for property owners that receive forbearance uh, on a multifamily federal, federal backed mortgage loan, the, if those owners are um, in forbearance, they, cannot, they still have to follow the moratorium protection. And so, for, for that segment of properties, uh, and it's hard to estimate exactly what number that is, uh, those would continue for the length or the, the duration of forbearance. So that, that could go on beyond July. I've included uh, sources that directly link to the actual CARES Act uh, language in case you're interested. Next slide, please. All right, so if you're a tenant and you're wondering, am I covered? Uh, there are a couple tools and none of them, uh, these are online, uh, so you have, to, you have to get over the digital divide here, but uh, none uh, of these- NLIHC.org, that's an organization I used to work for. 
National Low Income Housing Coalition. <laughs> a terrific organization. Of Way out, back. <laughs> they put out a lot of great material and tools. This is a, they're, they have a database that's uh, searchable um, by address. Uh, I've noted though that it's not perfect and, and you know, the coalition or the, they'll admit it's not perfect. It has information about multifamily uh, complexes insured by the FHA, securitized or, or loans purchased by Fannie and Freddie, properties that are supported by uh, low income housing tax credit, HUD, USDA programs. Um, but the, the, the database is, it, it may not help you if you're in a single family rental house, uh, one to four units, and um, it, it could be protected, uh, you just won't, it won't, it may not come up. And so Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have also come out with their own search tools. Uh, those links are, are here. And uh, um, Jenny's gonna post these on uh, the county website. So folks can download this and click these links to find right. those tools. Next slide. Uh, so there are in gaps in these this sort of state and federal mix of protections. Um, Delegate Henson began to mention some of them. Um, the protection uh, from pandemic rent hikes is not included in the protections I just detailed. Uh, but we've seen already that Montgomery County has a freeze on rent hikes uh, or on rent um, rate rates for the duration of the state of emergency plus 90 days. Howard County uh, has pending legislation uh, that's similar. Um, and Baltimore City has sent a bill last night to the mayor to do the same. Montgomery County's bill uh, allows 2.6% rent increases, which is uh, tracks with the consumer price index. Uh, but Howard County and Baltimore City just have a flat out uh, moratorium on rent increases. Uh, Baltimore City's and Howard County's also include um, late fee protection. The I've mentioned uh, the bill introduced last night, bill number 38-20 uh, for Anne Arundel County. This uh, provide, I don't have to see the language, but it, you know, foreseeably it, it shares um, in common with the other jurisdictions, a, a freeze on rent increases. Um, Howard County's bill is a little bit more aggressive than uh, than what we're seeing elsewhere because it it tries to fill in a gap, which is that landlords can still terminate a uh, expiring lease. Uh, so if you're month to month or you have a, a term lease expiring, um, there's there's no existing protection for you. Uh, landlords can send you a notice to quit uh, for the expiring uh, uh, lease or tenancy. Howard County has stepped into that void and said uh, that there, there won't be uh, any terminations uh, like that. Um, I think one point of contention will be whether uh, state law occupies that area of landlord-tenant law um, and preempts uh, what Howard County is trying to do, uh, but I won't make the case for the other side. Um, some of the other protections that we need to see after the state of emergency and the CARES coverage uh, expires uh, would be around long-standing due process in, uh, deficiencies in the eviction process. So um, folks might know that landlords can file as soon as the rent uh, is late. Uh, there are no requirements for uh, mediation or uh, attempts to secure rental assistance before an eviction order is issued. Uh, there are, um, there's no requirement for a judge to, there, there's no discretion for a judge to um, postpone a, eviction or deny eviction um, based merely on the economic um, circumstances of the, the renter who's coming to court. Uh, so, you know, those are those are areas where we we need to see some action taken. It will probably have to ha have to happen uh, in the general assembly or by executive order of the governor. Next slide. How many more slides you got? I've got two, and I can just wrap those up really quickly. Okay, <laughs> that was yeah. Uh, so I did mention there's some homeowner protections in the CARES Act. 
Uh, so folks can see that there, are, there is a moratorium that ends soon on foreclosures. Uh, the, there's a forbearance provision of 180 days that can be extended by homeowner request. Uh, and then the final slide is just about the utility uh, shutoff moratorium, which is also a product of the governor's executive order. That'll end on June 1st. So thank okay. you for bearing with me. Yeah, no, that's really useful stuff. Um, and there's a lot to wrap to wrap your head around. And it's great that we have smart people like you to help 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 do that. Um, it's a little scary though that that um, what could be happening when we hit that cliff at the end of July. And uh, um, anyway, uh, we we do have some things that can be done, and we'll get into those in a, in a minute. Um, but let me bring on Kathy Ebner, president and CEO of Homes for America. So tell us what um, tell us what Homes for America does, and and where you are, you know, with what you have in the county first. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Homes for America is a uh, mission-oriented um, developer and owner of affordable rental communities. We've been around since 1994, and since that time, have developed 82 communities consisting of um, nearly 6,600 homes. Uh, in Anne Arundel County, we own uh, six communities consisting of 405 homes um, spread throughout the county in Odenton, uh, Annapolis, City of Annapolis, and in Glen Burnie. Um, you know, from an owner's perspective, uh, this has certainly been a very concerning and uncertain time. Uh, clearly, never before has having a home been so important. Uh, you know, our residents that we house are among the most vulnerable, right? You know, there are the families that are living paycheck to paycheck. There are seniors with health concerns. There are persons with disabilities. So we take very seriously our responsibility to house our residents and um, and keep them safe. I mean, that that has been, um, you know, what our focus has been, time and attention and effort on, you know, really from the inception of the pandemic is making sure our residents are safe and protecting their welfare. And I'm, and that is true for the other affordable housing owners as well throughout uh, the state of Maryland, as I've been talking with them. Um, you know, obviously, in addition to safety concerns, the virus has generated enormous financial concerns for our residents, right? We know that many of our residents have had a loss or a reduction of income, um, if not a total loss, and therefore have had trouble paying the rent. Um, you know, obviously, in addition to complying with the CARES Act, as um, Zafra was talking about, and the you know, eviction moratorium and all those rules and regulations, um, you know, I will say that Homes for America is voluntarily suspending budgeted renting during this time period. That was an easy decision to make right from the get-go. We knew that that was the right decision to help ease the financial burden of um, our residents. And I think you know, many other affordable um, housing owners are doing the same. Um, What's really important during this time period and what we're emphasizing to our residents is that they keep in contact and communication with the property manager. And you know, when they're in a situation where they can't make the rent payment, then they can make arrangements with the property staff to, for a payment plan. And that's, that's really important to keep up that communication, establish a payment plan that makes sense. Um, and, you know, as we're coming out of this period, those residents that are, you know, have been communicating with the property staff and are able, you know, keeping up with the payment plan, that will be very, very important. Um, you know, because obviously we, you know, we will continue to work with residents to ensure that we can keep them in their homes. And that is our number one goal, to be able to keep all the residents um, in their homes. Um, Obviously, this is a very concerning matter for our organization, right? You know, that rent revenue is critical to our property operations. It is the source of funds with which we pay our operating costs, you know, which consist of many things, right? You know, our utilities, our maintenance expense, it's how we can upkeep our properties. Uh, Delegate Henson, you know, mentioned um, our property uh, tax, you know, payments. Uh, and um, in addition to our mortgage and debt service payment. So, you know, without adequate rent revenue, you know, we cannot continue to operate properties. So, thankfully, um, April's rent collections really went better than expected. I think that was a surprise to a lot of folks. Um, that was the case for our portfolio. 
Um, it was the case also in the state of Maryland and comparing, you know, other property owners and it seems to be nationally as well. However, I think that, you know, the May rent collection is still very uncertain and unclear. Uh, it's a moving target, data is coming in, um, you know, so we still aren't sure exactly where we are. I think we'll know better in about a week. But, you know, nonetheless, uh, this is going to be a long, slow slug to recovery. So, you know, even if, um, you know, April was better than expected, and even if May goes better than we think, I, I'm not sure that that foretells June, July, August, even through the rest of the year. It's going to take a long time to get ourselves back up and going. And, you know, and I think, you know, rental assistance programs is really going to be key to, you know, being able to get us through this period, this crisis, and, you know, emerge from it with our affordable housing communities and other rental communities, you know, intact. And so, you know, to that extent, big kudos to ACDS, Kathy Cook and her team, and certainly you, your leadership, um, County Executive, on standing up so quickly the eviction prevention program um, that was so welcome, and um, you know I know many other localities are now exploring to do the same, and um, the Maryland Department of Housing Community Development are having conversations about doing it the same, and um, really believe that that is going to be key for going forward. Great, it's it's um it's so important to hear the perspective of of the the owner of the of the units. Because if the money's not there to keep up the units, we know what happens and, and uh, the whole thing crumbles. Um, okay, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you ended too with the eviction prevention program comment because um, um, a lot of what we've talked about so far is going to lead into the last two speakers that we have um, who both work for Anne Arundel County and um, Kathy Koch and, and Carnitra White. And... Um, you know, thinking back on uh, when I first came in and I first met both of you, <laughs> um, you were here long before I was, thank goodness. Um, uh, you know, we got together and we said, you know, we don't believe that the needs of the most vulnerable people in this county have been met, what can we do? And we talked about what we could do on the housing front. And, and um, I've always believed that rental assistance is a pretty effective way to you know, direct assistance to the people where they need it the most. And so we actually set up, um, there had been a very small program, I think for veterans in the county before, and, and um, we decided to add to that. And it was gonna be a program, you know, largely to help people who are transitioning from homelessness, because we knew that um, folks coming out of shelters in Anne Arundel County, when they're ready and they have everything set up and they've got some income and ready to go, it's really hard to find a place um, and, and hard to find that extra income to be able to do that. Um, so then this came along and um, you had just done all the work to set that up. And we said, well, um, it seems like a no brainer. We're, we, we've got to do some eviction prevention rental assistance. So let's figure out how to, how to structure it so that it works. And that of course um, is Kathy's job and her team. And, and, um, and we knew that we were likely to get some federal money, but we didn't know when we first set it up. So you, you can talk about how we use some casino money and this other money for rental assistance to patch it together for our first million bucks. Um, but um, the demand has been huge, as you can imagine. Uh, and um, Anne Arundel County is getting $101 million of money through the CARES Act. And um, most counties are getting this kind of money. And the question is, how do you spend that money? And I, I suspect that um, the demand in this program for more and more of that money will be high. And um, from where I'm sitting, there's nothing really more important, um, this and feeding people. And so um, this is gonna be a big part of our response to the coronavirus and probably a very significant part of our spending of the federal CARES money. So, um, Kathy, you can explain uh, how it got here, how it works, and and uh, yeah, and, and anybody who's listening from another county, please listen in because others do need to do this. Um, I think we might be the first in the state setting this up, but it's not it's not simple. I think you're still muted, though. Can you unmute? There you go. Good. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I just want I just got off a phone call with Baltimore City, Baltimore County. 
and it's they're all talking about it and we're also talking about we want to push the state of Maryland to think about the same thing because the, the demand is great and I do want to say that um, I'm thankful I get better I, you know I've been at this job for a very long time and for some miraculous reason I've gotten really good at my job in the last year and I think it has a whole lot to do with elected officials I work for so um, I'm really happy with my executive my state delegates and um, I was incredibly proud as I watched my county executive my county council last night and um, ne nearly in tears as I watched them um, testify and talk push push forward the issues of housing so I get better as the people I work for are incredible and I also want to recognize ACT because you're right, we couldn't do any of this without the all the push that we get from ACT. So, um, so we're really excited about the fact we started their eviction prevention program uh, with our first a million dollars. We um, we took um, 500,000 from um, county funds that were made available for housing in this year's budget, and then we also our LDC, our local development council. Um, made another $500,000 available through the video lottery funds. Um, and not to anybody's surprise, we've gotten over 600 calls in a very two-week time frame, um, and we're processing those as fast as we can. Um, the the goal of the program is to um, is we talked about the fact that you know as this comes online, what we want to do is make sure that people aren't too far behind. So the closer, the, the more even we can get them, the better. can we solve all the problems? Maybe not because the demand is so great, but we want to get people to be able to be into, like Kathy was talking into these payment plans and talking to their landlords and making sure that they um, are getting themselves in a good position once the moratorium is lifted. Um, we ha um, have been um, serving people at 80% and below the median income. And we're going forward, we're probably going to target that more down to people at 60% and below the median income. And just 60% is uh, for a family of four is approximately $60,000. And um, we're also to people that have been affected by that's pre COVID income, pre COVID income. Yep. Okay. Yep. And um, also COVID income, you know, what their income is uh, based on their unemployment and the benefits that they are receiving. So um, we look at that now and we, they must also document that they are, their income has been affected by COVID. So um, I think that um, our county exec is going to announce that there's more funds coming. Is that you want me to announce that right now? Okay, let's make some news folks. Ready? <laughs> Um, yeah, the news for now, uh, and there may be more news later, but uh, we know that that first million dollars is, is um, long gone, even though the checks haven't been written because we're waiting until it's, it's needed, but um, for another three million. So um, two million more out of the CARES and then the CDBG money that comes federal for housing um, would, would be another three. So that'd be a total of four. And um, yeah, and another thing I want to mention about it, though, is that um, um, you do not have to be, you don't have to have papers, puppies, if you know what I mean, um, to qualify. Um, that we got a lot of undocumented, um, hardworking folks in our county who are not eligible. I call them excluded workers. And uh, they're not eligible for unemployment insurance. They can't get um, some of the, you know, SNAP and other programs that are federal. And, and um, uh, there's nothing preventing, uh, preventing those folks from applying for this rental assistance. So um, the exciting news is that a lot of people, we had over 600 phone calls, we're processing close to 300. The other people are on a waiting list. So with this new money that's become available, we'll be able to start processing and take additional phone calls. And the thing that we want to let everybody know, the, what can you can do to help us process your application faster is to make sure that you have documentation. Um, and again, whether it's a W-2 pay stub, your tax return, or we will work with you to if you're, um, you've been cleaning houses and you don't really have any documentation, we'll work with you and help you figure that out. Um, we will need copies. One thing we will need work with your landlords. Um, we will need a copy of your lease and evidence of your loss of income and something from your landlord saying that um, you are late on your, on your rent, okay? So these are documents that you can start to collect um, before you call us so that we can help process you more quickly. 
Um, we also will help with utility payments if you're behind on your utility payments. And again, what we need is some evidence from the utility company that, that you are behind. And what we will be doing is paying the landlord directly or paying the, the utility company directly. So um, be sure you're working with your landlord because one thing we will need is a W-9 from your landlord um, because we will be issuing 1099s. Um, it is income. So we do have to follow the, the federal IRS laws. So um, if you can start, if you're thinking and you need, you need assistance and you think you might be eligible, please start to collect this doc, these documents. Give us a call, 410-222-7600, um, and you go to extension two. And when you call, one of the important things is, is please speak slowly, leave your name, your telephone number, and most importantly, please leave your email address. It may take, we've repositioned a lot of our staff and we're responding as quickly as we can, but it may take us a little over a week to get back to you, but we will get back to you, okay? So please make sure you leave that um, information. You can also go to our website at www.acdsinc.org. And you can also leave information on, on our website and get more information about the program too from there. So let us know. Thank you. And we should note that this is pretty pretty labor intensive, that, that we're not just providing the assistance, but the counseling um, and the counsel, not just to figure out who should get the money, but, but um, to make sure that um, working with the landlord people knowing their rights and and even figuring out their finances in some cases, right? These are, these are housing counselors that you've got doing They're this, housing right? Counselors. And so, so we'll work with you to make sure that you're accessing all the um, benefits that you might be eligible for. Um, we'll talk to you about that um, and we'll help you figure that out too. And the other thing too, is that I know we're not talking about home ownership. Um, we talked a little bit about it, but also as um, if you're having a tough time with making your mortgage payments, you're not sure whether you fall under the law is, what's going to be happening. Our counselors are also available to talk to you about that too. So, yes. And it sounds like you may be needing to hire some more counselors. I know that you've been in the process of doing one more, but. <laughs> That's right. We, we kind of reposition. And I think the important thing is, is that, um, and I think Delicate Henson touched on this and Kathy Ebner also touched on this. We were, we're helping, we're definitely helping the tenants, but you know, um, our landlords are part of our business community and helping them and making sure that they stay whole and that we keep them, keep our rental units available too. It's very important. Right, right. All right, so um, in our county, we have people who don't even start out with housing, who are homeless, um, some you know, living in, in uh, camps and some living in homeless shelters, and, and I know that in the very beginning of this pandemic, one of the very first things our health department did uh, was go to our homeless shelters and evaluate the conditions to make sure that people weren't, um, I hope I'm still on, uh, okay, to um, make sure that um, uh, social distancing was practiced and best practices for a congregate housing site and um, actually provided hotel rooms for for people who needed to get out of a couple of places and and um, um, but um, let's start Carnitra with you just explaining what services the county does provide um, for folks when they're homeless good evening everyone thank you county executive Pittman um, we at the Department of Social Services we are the homeless service agency for Anne Arundel County and we provide a continuum of services for persons who are experiencing or may be at risk of experiencing homelessness. And so I'll start with some of the preventive services that we provide. Um, we're, a partner, we're a partner where we also provide eviction prevention as well as um, utility assistance. And so persons can contact us if they think they're going to um, be at the point where they're gonna have an eviction. Um, we have uh, counselors who are able to assist with that and do some diversion um, work with them as well. Um, they can call us at 410-421-8410. So we have um, our own funding and our budget for eviction prevention and utility assistance, um, but we also work with Kathy and her team as well 
So we're able to connect um, persons with different resources within the county. So um, once again, that phone number is 410-421-8410. And so I always like to start with the preventive pieces um, because that's really our efforts. Our effort is to prevent persons from, um, uh, from being homeless um, or unsheltered. Um, but if persons are find themselves at the point where they are unsheltered or experiencing a period of homelessness, they can contact us. Um, we do screenings of those persons. We really try to make sure that um, people are um, verted, meaning that we work with them to develop alternative housing solutions when possible um, to prevent entry into shelter. And so, um, but if a person is needed, um, is, thinks they need um, shelter, uh, now or at any time, um, they can call us our coordinated entry phone number. So I'm given yet another phone number, and that number is 410-417-7367. Uh, uh, once again, that's 410-417-7367. Um, and then we are able to um, do uh, some assessment with that person and coordinate with them to get into shelter. We don't want anyone living on the street. Um, we want people to be able to be housed. We know that that is challenging at this time, as well as even when we're not in a crisis, housing um, is, is challenging as well as a shelter. Um, if it's after five and people are in crisis, we um, ask people to contact our crisis response um, if they need shelter after hours. Um, and here's the third phone number that I'm giving out tonight. Um, and that number is 410-768-522. And that's to our crisis response line anytime in the evenings or at night, if persons are in crisis, um, experiencing homelessness or other crisis, they should um, contact that number. We do also have a housing specialist who um, work, we work with landlords to ensure that persons who are um, hard to rent, hard to rent persons, meaning they either have some credit um, issues, we've developed relationships with landlords in order to place our chronically homeless persons who've experienced homeless for a number of times into housing situations. Um, last year, we were successful to um, do this for 58 persons who had been chronically homeless for a while and to actually get them into um, housing um, for that, right? And we also have a street outreach uh, team who are out um, visiting persons who are living on the street and in encampments in our county. Um, we're currently doing that. We do that continuously and we're doing it also through the crisis where we're providing MREs, we're doing screenings, making sure that they understand um, about the, um, the pandemic and what resources are available in our county for them. And as uh, County Executive Pittman indicated, we also have um, sheltered persons. Um, we've stood up a um, hotel for our, um, for our sheltering of persons who don't have a place to shelter in. Um, so we've created that place to shelter in um, for, for persons. We served over 80 persons um, uh, throughout this time period since, the, since March um, up, until, up until this time period. So we have a, a whole continuum of services um, from prevention all the way to the point of if people are, ex are unsheltered and experiencing a period of homelessness, try to help them. And we continue case manage with, management with them to provide the resources to help move them into housing. If we can do rapid rehousing, we work with our partners to get rapid rehousing and get people into housing um, as soon as we can. So I just have to say uh, that it's, it's not only Kathy and Carnitra and some of the other department heads as well in, in, in Reynolds County government who've been in the trenches for years trying to trying to just help people, but um, their staffs, are, their teams that they've got working with them are just just amazing people. And, um, you know, I've, I've been to Carnitra's big annual, whatever, it, it was It was a holiday party, I guess. And, and I mean, just the, you got a bigger staff than, than Kathy does, but Kathy's team also is just, I mean, they're people who, they've been there for years, they are so committed, um, they work so hard, they, 
they don't get paid a whole lot. Um, probably shouldn't say that, but <laughs> they'll come looking for raises. But um, they don't get paid enough, that's for sure, for what they do. And and um, and it's great to hear that we've got systems set up, like in social services, homeless systems. The question is going to be, you know, what's the capacity if if the things we were talking about happen, the numbers really grow. Um, what's that going to do? And and um, I mean. That's one of the reasons why I've been a little bit of a, of a uh, tightwad lately about our CARES Act money, because I think we need to be saving it for this, for, for this crisis, really, and, and um, um, you know, meeting the needs of the people who are, who are going to need it the most. Uh, but thanks for everything you're doing. I also have to say that that team has, um, we brought somebody in when I came in. Um, actually, she's only been le less than a year partway through, um, Dr. K. Bodgester Brown, to help coordinate these agencies that do social services and health, service, health, and 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 all the health and human rights agencies, so that um, so that we have a better out sense of what the outcomes are and strategy, and make sure we're all moving in the same direction. Thank you, Kay, who's who's probably listening but not on the call. Um, so um, yeah, it's sort of a good news story, but it's scary. Uh, with what we're facing. But we've got, we do have a few questions that, uh, and we're gonna run over. We just at seven o'clock and, and um, you know, Facebook Live doesn't cut you off, so neither does Zoom. So we'll go a few more minutes and, and <laughs> cause I wanna hear some more from some of you. Hopefully people will hang with us. Um, but here's one that a few of you might actually have some thoughts about. Um, my daughter lives in an apartment complex that has a habit of infringing or the owner has a habit of infringing on their residents' rights and getting people evicted. They often enter apartments without proper notice and other violations, but residents are afraid of eviction and cannot afford to move. Can any action be taken against them to improve the living situation without identifying her and risking retaliation? There's a name here, but I won't read it. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Um, Maybe we start with the Ever. attorney and then go to the community organizer or vice versa. <laughs> go ahead, so, Tony. You, you hit it first. So I would like to say, first of all, she should know her rights. It's a lot of rights that the residents have that they aren't aware of. And um, she definitely could reach out to me and I can help her maneuver that. But there is a law in Anne Arundel County for no right to retaliation. And I think um, a lot of our residents need to understand and look at the attorney general's laws, look at the county laws and the rights that they have to not be retaliated against for speaking up for conditions that they have a right to be in safe environments. So first, I think she should absolutely identify and know what her rights are. And, um, you know, I'm available if she would like to reach out to me. Um, my email address is strong Pratt, S T R O N G P R A T T W A R D, the number four at gmail.com. Um, and uh, would our attorney like to comment? And then I think Shanika is smiling. I know she's going to have something to say. <laughs> Go ahead, Zaffer. Well, this has been coming up. Um, in, across uh, all the communities uh, our clients come from, uh, the amount of fear of reprisal is really just through the roof right now. Um, there, the you know the law is pretty clear in terms of protection against uh, retaliation for um, certain protected activities, uh, such as asserting rights under the lease, uh, making complaints about conditions, uh, whether it's to the landlord or to uh, the housing agency, the, um, of course, the problem right now is that even if you wanted to pursue your legal rights um, and, and file something as the landlord, the courts are not going to hear that case for a while. Uh, so for the immediate term, um, I think the, the legal solution really is unclear. And what we've seen is more effective right now is the organizing um, when you're not an individual, but you're a group, you have uh, stronger leverage and power. Uh, and we're, we're seeing at the same time that folks are complaining and uh, asking questions about retaliation, we are seeing an uptick uh, in Baltimore City and elsewhere 
uh, in organizing, in tenants forming and asking questions about their right to form resident associations or tenant associations. Excellent. Delegate Henson, would you have anything to comment on this? Thank you. Um, my comment would be ditto, ditto. Um, I would only add to that, um, in the city of Annapolis, they have a the part of their non-discrimination ordinance. It protects um, residents as, as it relates to their immigration status. And so that cannot be used against them for retaliation in their housing either. So if anyone has any fears about that, landlords cannot use they cannot threaten to report. They cannot threaten to use their um, status, documented, undocumented, against them um, if they are exercising any landlord-tenant rights that they have within the city of Annapolis. Um, and I would only add to that as well, just document, document. Whenever people go to enforce their rights, um, when I have my legal hat on as an attorney, I would always say there's the real world and then there's court. Um, in the real world, you know, you live your life in context. And then in court, people expect you to have, you know, all your ducks in a row. So just um, document, document. Okay. Yeah, Kathleen. I'm just going to suggest there's the um, Fair Housing Action Center of Maryland. I don't happen to have their telephone number, but um, that's a good organization to call to help with tenants' rights. Okay. Fair, action, Fair Housing Action Center of Maryland. Okay, from uh, Suzanne Martin, who some of us know, uh, runs, organized the Annapolis Immigration Justice Network, uh, says, we have several undocumented clients who have been threatened with eviction, although we've been able to explain to them that they can't be evicted right now due to the moratorium, is there a possibility that the state will extend the current 120-day deadline of July 15th for evictions? Um, and then she says, I've been on conference calls where I heard that even after the July 15th deadline, a landlord must still give 30 days written notice. Is that true? Uh, Zaffer, Zaffer, you want to go with this one? So uh, I think that the, um, the slides that I presented about the CARES Act coverage goes to what the, this individual is talking about. So I think they, some of the dates a little uh, fudged there, um, but uh, right now, we don't know uh, whether there'll be an extension of the moratorium, whether through the federal legislation that might be forthcoming or, or through the, the governor uh, or the chief judge. Um, it's, we're really kind of in wait and see, of course. Um, the 30-day um, the the moratorium is linked to the um, emergency order, right? Declaration? Say again? The governor's moratorium is linked to the length of the emergency declaration? That's right. Okay, so, so when he lifts that, he's lifting the moratorium unless he says otherwise. That's right. Okay. Um, so the protections that he put in his order only live during that state of emergency. Um, and But the 30-day the sort of um, rule that this individual is referring to comes from the, the federal law. Okay. And I should note that some organizations, uh, maybe yours was one of them, um, wrote a letter uh, to the governor requesting that the Department of Housing and Community Development get activated on this issue, right? Um, I know that during the last recession, they, they, had, they had counseling and assistance, um, and, and also that the Baltimore Metropolitan Council has a committee that deals with housing that's also written to the government. Do you know, does anybody know about this letter and what they asked for? Yeah, so, so the, um, the advocates um, asked for, I believe it was the 53 million, I think it was, in um, CARES Act funds be uh, um, appropriated by the governor to uh, a rental assistance program. And then the Baltimore, um, Metropolitan Council also um, has been talking to the state about rental assistance and using some of they, they just got another appropriation on the last act, federal law that was passed, um, 16 million in community development block grant dollars that are going directly to the state. And so they're also asking them to continue to think about putting more funds into to rental assistance. Okay, good. So um, people, are, people are pushing for that. It hasn't happened as far as we know, though, at this point. Um, and um, uh, this is a question just for you, Kathy, Kathy Ebner. Um, uh, where, what are the, this is from Odessa, maybe she's looking for a place and she'd really like the way you uh, 
you talked, what are the, where are the communities, uh, what are the communities where Homes for America are located? Um, you mean the names of the communities? How about this? How about if I give out my phone number and then okay. she can call and then we can talk, talk through, you know, what, what would be the best fit? Um, our number here is 10269-1222. That's amazing. Okay. And then she'll be routed to me. Okay. And and you did say earlier Annapolis, Odenton, and Glen Burnie are the, the communities where they are, but that's not the name. Okay. The communities are age restricted, um, you know, for your senior populations. And then, you know, one of them is um, project based subsidized. So there's just, it'd be better if I just talked to her and we can kind of go through the options. Yeah. Um, and Mary asked Are the eviction prevention program payments, the county program, I'm assuming, going to the landlord or the tenants? The answer is the landlord. Do you want to explain why that is? Um, to make sure that it, the, the funds are being directly used for that purpose so that these, these funds are going directly to the landlord to make sure that you're, you're brought current. And, and if I can add that, um, you know, people talking about whether they can rent units in Homes for America's beautiful projects uh, or any of the affordable housing complexes, what I tell everybody, if you call them and they say there's a waiting list, Tell them that's okay. We want to get on get on the waiting list because no matter what, and there are waiting lists throughout the entire county. But if you get on the waiting list, at least you'll have an option. If you can't make a decision today, you don't know what's going to be happening in your life six months from now or a year. So get on that list. It's worth time and effort. Yeah, and I just want to say <clears throat> this may be related to last night council meeting, but that um, I assume that some of the some of the housing that you've built has been with low income housing tax credits. Talking to me, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, with yes. A, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's a competitive program where um, a, a developer, whether nonprofit or for profit, applies and it takes it takes some time to get approved and and um, takes a, quite a bit of time. And, and we haven't gotten many of them them in the county. Um, I think, what is it, one and 18 and two and 17 or 16. a couple a year at most, right? 13 throughout the county, three in the city of Annapolis, 16. Total over since the program started. So um, yeah, so the bill last night was simply a tweak because um, there were places where the school capacity charts, um, when they applied, it was open. And then by the time it got through, it had changed and and um, and these are fairly small, you know, um, small units. And, and um, you know, I found it unfortunate that a lot of people who I agree with on a lot of issues about land use in the county um, somehow thought that we were talking about um, multi-unit housing all over everybody's neighborhood in large quantities. And, and that's not what this is. It's, it's really um, just trying to make it possible for for us to partake in these these programs so that we can do some affordable housing in our county. Um, so I, I hope that bill will pass. Um, I think it probably will. Um, I hope that people recognize that um, it's actually a good thing to have housing of all of all costs for 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 all ages, incomes, and races and nationalities and a diverse community. Um, <clears throat> Well, I think that is most of the uh, the other questions I see have been asked, have been answered already in some of the comments that you've made. Um, is there anything anybody would like to say that I missed or that you missed, I should say, before we close? Delegate Henson, you just have a way with words. Can, can you, <clears throat> you kind of help us, help me wrap this up because... Uh, you're more articulate than I am, and uh, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words right now. <laughs> no, I just, I think the information and the content here has been excellent, and I thank you for curating the panel. I think that there has been something for everybody. If you're a renter and you need something, I think you can tune into this and watch the rebroadcast and find information. If you're a property owner, I think you can understand that we're not leaving you out of the conversation either but that we absolutely understand that this is an ecosystem and that it's the entire landscape that we have to really protect and provide for. And I appreciate that everybody here on the line understands that and um, is fully invested 
And I appreciate that what your concept is, is building better, that it is not just getting back to, you know, what we had before, because there are policy advocates on here who were looking to make our housing better before we entered into this in March. We, want, we were all fighting, you know, the good fight to make sure that housing had what it needed before this. You had legislation. Tony was organizing. The FAR was working um, in the Public Justice Center. Kathy and uh, Kathy and Kathy <laughs> were uh, working to get, you know, quality homes built. Carnitra was working with families to get them in housing. Um, we were all doing this work before this happened. So it is the goal is to truly build better. Um, and it's to make sure that people have the housing that they need. Um, my mom always says that, where you live, you know, teaches you how to live. And so for us, it's making sure that where you live is someplace that's, you know, quality and safe. And so right now it's just meeting that very basic need. So thanks for opening up the platform and providing an opportunity for us to address those housing needs. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And it really is about, you know, when we say build back better, it really is. Um, we're learning things from from the stresses we're all under that our communities are under, and and uh, it's teaching us how to do better. And uh, housing is definitely where we can do that. Um, and uh, I think I hope that this community in Anne Arundel County feeling more like a community, and we'll all come out of our houses whenever we come out, <laughs> yeah, and feel like we all contributed to to beating this thing, and and we're all connected. Um, so. Uh, we'll make progress. So thank you, everybody. Um, this was really, this was, this was a good time. Thanks. Thank you.